So the Marie Keating team would like to extend a warm welcome to those of you who are new to the webinar today. Um, and also to welcome back those of you who are with us for the last couple of weeks. Um, today we are midway through our six week webinar. Um, um, and these workshops are focusing very much on those of you and your families who have been through a cancer journey, now converted to a webinar to keep us all together. For, for the last number of weeks uh, and months, in fact, we've all taken steps to mind ourselves and each other. We have now stepped into phase one of COVID-19 recovery. And I know this is an anxious time as we watch how our country reacts to the lifting of some of the restrictions. We still need to stay safe and protect each other. And we also need to look after our own health. So if you are a cancer patient or are still on follow up care having completed treatment, this is a message for you. Are you or a loved one getting treatment for cancer in our hospitals during this difficult time? This might be chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Hospitals have made changes to the way we deliver your treatment. We made these changes in the interest of patient safety. We understand that you might be worried about attending hospital for your treatment. We will discuss your treatment with you at every appointment. We want you to know that we are trained and equipped to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. We will contact you before you start your treatment to check in with you. At every appointment, we will make sure you are well. We will tell you how to protect yourself from COVID-19 and what to do if you are unwell between treatments. If you have any side effects during your treatment, don't try to ignore or put up with them. Contact your hospital team. We will guide you on how to manage these side effects to help you through this time. Your health is very important to us. Continue to attend your radiotherapy or chemotherapy sessions. We are here to look after you and keep you safe as you continue your cancer treatment. So please use um, these learning experiences as an opportunity week on week to make some changes in your lives or create action plans for yourself and work on achieving them over the six week span and beyond that, of course. Um, an example in the first week was to consider how much fruit you, you would eat in a day. Um, and it's usually five to seven pieces of fruit. Um, and think about whether you need to modify your diet in order to get the best out of maintaining a healthy weight and diet. Last week, you learned about the sheer importance of exercise and smoke, sitting has become the new smoking. So moving every 20 minutes is extremely important. Um, and this week, we're going to learn from Breach about the importance of sleeping well. So ask yourself after the webinar, is there something I can do to make my sleep better? So please sit back, um, relax, and enjoy the learning. I'm Helen Forrestal, Director of Nursing at the Marie Keating Foundation. Um, so we have some housekeeping rules. They're a little bit different, obviously, because this is a webinar. You are all in the comfort of your own home, so make yourselves comfortable, make yourselves a drink, and make sure you can see our screen and hear us. If your phone is on, maybe turn it off or silence it. Um, Jennifer is in the background sorting out her uh, technological problems, as you could see we had some at the beginning, but they've been rectified now. So thank you, Jennifer, for, for all your assistance with this. As an attendee to the, sem to the webinar, um, you do not have the ability to speak um, or turn on your video. You will see at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A um, uh, button. Um, this session, the quest, the Q and A session, will be moderated by our senior oncology nurse Bernie. So thank you, Bernie, for doing this. We would love you to participate um, during the webinar. I think it's a very important part of of the webinar that you get the opportunity to ask questions that might be very specific to you, where you may not have had the opportunity before. You can do this anonymously, or you can do it by name, whichever you would prefer. So click on the the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, click into it, 
type your question and make sure to hit the return or enter key so that we receive the question at our end. Um, when we receive the question, we will answer it at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Keep an eye on the questions that are being submitted. Um, and if, you, um, if it's a question you are going to ask or would like to ask, you can see that there's an icon like, like the icon on the Facebook page. Um, click on that um, and your question will actually uh, probably go to the top of the queue and is very likely to be answered. Um, there is a chat button also, but this is not for answering questions, for asking questions. So just make sure you don't use that one to ask your questions. All our webinars are being recorded. So you will receive a recording um, shortly after the session. It's always nice to know, I suppose, who we're networking with um, virtually as we don't see people um, in a seminar uh, room as we would have before. So we'd like to welcome our colleagues from Roche, our committed sponsors for this series of webinars. Thank you very much. Our Marie Keating staff um, and our nurses and staff and Liz Yates, our CEO. Those who have attended Survive and Thrive programmes previously um, face to face, um, but who still need to um, refresh themselves on how to live well um, with, a, with a greater quality of life. And members of our positive living group, women with metastatic breast cancer, and men and women um, in the wider community. And you men and women who have been affected by cancer and understand what it is like for you and your families to live through this, and especially during these difficult times. You will have received an agenda for this afternoon um, and I'd just like to talk you through that now. We are delighted to have a diverse team of experts to deliver our webinars week on week. So on the first week you, have, you would have heard from Avine Bannon, a registered dietitian. Last week you heard from Dr. Laurie McDermott who um, is the operations manager for Exwell Medical. Um, Next week, you will hear from Dr. Eddie Murphy, who is a clinical psychologist. Um, and week five, we will hear from uh, Michaela Higgins. She'll talk about the anxieties people are experiencing while in hospital and are coming in for appointments and possibly the postponement of scans as well. And on the final week, we will hear from Mary Moriarty, um, who will talk to us about managing signs and symptoms during this time and maybe some mindfulness as well. And this afternoon, um, I'd like to welcome Breej Leddy. Breej, we're delighted to have you here with us today. Um, so um, these are our panel here. And this is Breej. So Breej uh, worked as a sleep psychologist in the Matter Private Hospital um, in 2003 and graduated from medical physics and physiology measurement in St. Kevin Street. And she proceeded to gain international qualifications um, in 2008. So uh, she took up the position of senior sleep psychologist in Bon Secours Hospital in 2012 um, and has a special interest and qualification in cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia very specifically. In, in 2013, she set up the Insomnia Clinic um, and there's, it's well, the first in Ireland, which is, which is really nice to know um, that we are actually concentrating our efforts in, in this area also. Um, in 2016, took up the position as manager of sleep um, and clinical physiology in Matter Private Hospital. Breed is a member of the Irish Sleep Society um, and also a member of the following international societies, as you can see there. And Breed is a regular contributor to radio, TV and newspaper articles. So Breed, we're very privileged to have you with us today. Um, thank you. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And uh, over to you, Breach. Thank you. Well, thank you, Helen. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, it's great that you're actually recognising the importance of sleep um, in our overall physical and mental health, you know. Um, so I'm going to um, today just talk about a little bit what normal sleep is. Particularly, I'm going to focus on insomnia. Um, but I'll also want to give more of a practical um, side of things, give practical tips that people can now take away from here today, that if they are having a problem with sleep, this is what I can do to help to, help to rectify that problem. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen here. Um, this is me here. So I'm going to this. Now, let me just start the slideshow. Um, 
all right from the beginning now okay um so as i said this is all about how to ensure we get enough good sleep and i've highlighted the good because as you will find out from listening to me it's not about the number of hours of sleep um, I suppose the first thing to understand is that sleep is actually a very, very structured process. Um, it's not something that just happens. Um, well, the only way we can tell whether somebody's actually asleep is by looking at brain activity. Um, and we have different stages of sleep that we actually go through during the night. So basically it involves light sleep, deep sleep, and dream sleep. And we run through different cycles. So usually when somebody starts to, to feel drowsy, it usually takes about 20 minutes um, in order to actually fall into a very, very light stage of sleep. And these can in, involve what we call little micro sleeps. You're just nodding off, you get that sensation of falling, you might even get a little bit of a, a little bit of a jump. Um, and that's really just the transition between being awake and asleep. It's really not good quality sleep. Um, and only about 5% of our night sleep would be made up with that. It's also if you're kind of lying there in bed and you don't know whether you're asleep, whether you're awake, because you're aware of everything that's going on around you. Pretty quickly, we fall into what we call a stage two sleep. Um, and about half of our night sleep is made up of that, but that's still not the good quality stuff. The good quality sleep um, comes about an hour after we've initially fallen asleep. Now on the diagram, it's marked as three and four, um, but actually now the new guidelines, we've just kind of plumped the two of those in together and it's just one stage of sleep. So that's our really, really deep sleep. Um, and that's the really important one. There where you see the little kind of the, the red line outline. Um, this is where, the whole body repairs itself. So cells regenerate, muscles recuperate, growth hormone for children, it's really important that they get enough of this deep sleep because growth hormone is produced in that stage of sleep. Um, about 20% of our night will be made up of that deep sleep. And we tend to only get that deep sleep towards the start of the night, within the first third. We tend not to get any at the latter end of the night. Um, that's why we shouldn't really be hitting the snooze buttons um, because you're only going to be getting a very light stage of sleep at that stage anyway, and that's normal. Um, then about, um, about 90 minutes after we've initially fallen asleep, roughly, then our whole brain activity actually speeds up again. And if we were looking at someone's brain activity, it looks like you're pretty much awake. Um, but you're obviously not awake. Um, and there are some very distinct changes that happen within that stage of sleep. Muscles become completely paralyzed, um, apart from two sets of muscles, which is your eye muscles, um, or your eye muscles and your respiratory muscles, because you're gonna continue to breathe and you're gonna have these rapid eye movements. Your breathing can become a little bit more unstable um, and you also, your heart rate can speed up during this. Um, and if you ever wake up and your heart is absolutely pounding, um, you may have been just after waking up from a dream. Um, and our dreams get longer as the night progresses because we have several cycles of sleep during the night. Um, and usually, I know at this time uh, during the COVID-19 period, an awful lot of people are actually talking about having more vivid dreams and more dreams than normal. Um, and there's a lot of kind of controversy over this. I suppose my take on it is, if you're asleep or there's a little bit of anxiety there, which we'll talk about, that causes sleep fragmentation. Um, and if it's a thing that you're waking up more often during the night, and if particularly if you're waking up from dream sleep, you're actually probably going to be more prone to actually remembering that. But we actually all have several cycles of dreams during the night. We tend not just to remember it. Um, but how that pattern looks is really going to determine how we function the next day. I suppose this is not something that we can just make happen. Um, and when we have a problem with sleep, we actually try even harder to make that happen. But that actually just adds to the problem because now you're enforcing what we, what we call nearly performance anxiety. What we have to remember is that our bodies follow this natural rhythm. And when it comes to sleep, sleep is so important, it has its own rhythm and it's a thing called a circadian rhythm. And it works over this 24 hour period. Um, and really what that means is, and I'm not gonna go into great, de great, great detail about this, but just to remember that it's the body thrives on routine, particularly sleep. And this whole rhythm is really driven by light and lack of light. 
And there are a couple of things that we really do have to take into account when we, we talk about these rhythms. Three main factors are our core body temperature, a sleep need or sleep debt, and a hormone, um, which is a thing called melatonin. So really in order for us to feel sleepy and to stay asleep, our core body temperature needs to dip. The need for sleep must be there, but also we need to have that um, production of melatonin. Um, and melatonin is only produced when there's a lack of light. But usually where the three of these come into contact, it's usually around 11 o'clock at night for most people, and that's where they tend to feel sleepy. Um, where the opposite happens, it's usually around seven, and that's where we tend to wake up. That's where we kind of call the normal circadian rhythm, but not everybody falls into that. So we have the kind of the, the night owl and the morning lark, and that just means your rhythm is just a little bit either pushed forward or brought back a wee bit. Um, as I said, I'm going to focus more so on insomnia for, for this, the program or for the purpose of this. Um, and if you can imagine when you really should be fast to sleep, maybe two, three, four o'clock in the morning with insomnia, you could be wide awake at that time. And what happens with insomnia is this whole rhythm becomes completely unstable. Um, a lot of us know what it's like to have jet lag. Um, and that just means that this rhythm is either pushed forward or brought back. So we're kind of living our day out of this normal rhythm. So it takes a little bit of a while to get back to normal. So with insomnia, you do feel the effects, all the effects that go along with jet lag, but actually it's much harder to get back into a normal pattern because there is no pattern. And that's the whole problem. And that's why you can have feel the effects of it so much, because I said sleep thrives on pattern. Probably the most common question I get asked is how much sleep do we need? Um, and there are guidelines like everything else. Um, normal for a, a young adult, um, anywhere between six and 11 hours, or sorry, six and 10 hours. Um, it just so happens that eight hours is in the middle of that. And we are absolutely all obsessed with getting this eight hour sleep. Um, but we have to remember it's not about hours. Um, there are certain sleep disorders, um, like a thing called obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, where people could be getting 10 hours sleep at night, but they're actually waking up absolutely exhausted. They are sleepy throughout the day. They're falling asleep at any given opportunity, but yet they're getting loads of sleep. Again, the reason for that is they're not getting the, that deep sleep, that stage three sleep. Um, so it's not about hours. Um, I had uh, somebody ring me yesterday in a terrible panic that they were only getting six hours sleep a night. Um, and they're really concerned that they're not getting their eight hours. But yet this person, they run their own business. Um, they're not at all sleepy during the day. Um, there are absolutely no symptoms of, of, of sleep deprivation whatsoever. But the fact that he's been, we're being constantly being told we need eight hours sleep. What I said to that patient was, guess what? You don't need eight hours. You're getting your six you're absolutely fine um, and stop panicking about it because that panic will actually start to cause a sleep problem. So it's all about the, no, the answer, I suppose, to how much sleep do you need? Everybody's different, but we, it's the number of hours of sleep you need that you get on a consistent, regular basis. Um, and the, no, that's the number of hours you need to make you feel refreshed throughout the day and that you're not sleeping at any given opportunity throughout that wakeful period. I said, everybody's different um, and it's just finding out on a consistent basis. And that's the key. It's having every single night pretty much the same. Um, but again, when that doesn't happen, it's, it's the insomnia that, that kind of kicks in because no two nights are actually the same. Um, consequences of, of poor sleep. Again, we all know what it's like to have the feel the effects of maybe one night's poor sleep. You're probably yawning a little bit more the next day. Your memory's probably not quite as sharp as it should be. You might be a little bit irritable. You might be a little bit cranky. But then when we talk about the, the kind of the, the long term effects, and this really starts to panic people um, because you see things here on this screen like, you know, um, impaired immune system and particularly for cancer patients that's a huge concern um, we also have risk of diabetes and um, all this kind of cardiovascular disease risk of obesity the one thing i would say to you is 
when we read maybe an article or something, it's telling, oh, oh, you have to get sleep or you're going to end up with all of these things. There are over 80 sleep disorders. So some sleep disorders are actually more, um, more dangerous than others. Um, and obstructive sleep apnea syndrome is, is one that I briefly talk about. That's, that's probably going to lead, we can nearly guarantee that goes untreated. It can lead to, to cardiovascular disease. When we talk about an insom insomnia, um, usually you need decades and decades of, of, of this kind of problem with sleep in order to have these long-term effects. Um, because the body is actually able to cope with a certain amount of sleep deprivation. Um, and it, but that first slide that I showed you about all the different stages of sleep, one, the way the body kind of copes with, with sleep deprivation is it actually increases the, the amount of deep sleep you get. You probably get more dream sleep. You might go into dream sleep a little bit quicker. So it just slots things around to, to make up for the fact that you're sleep deprived. And the one thing you shouldn't do is try to bank sleep or try to make up for lost sleep because you actually don't need to do that. So if I only get a couple of hours sleep tonight, I don't want to now add on those, la la those lost hours of sleep onto my sleep tonight, the next night. You don't need to do that. The body knows you're sleep deprived and it'll actually make to rectify itself for that. Um, as I said, why are we sleepy? There are actually over 80 sleep disorders. I'm certainly not going to go into any of these, all of these now. Um, but just to remember that, okay, you might not be getting, one of the major causes, I suppose now at the minute is, we may not be getting um, a very good quality sleep or might be fragmented if there is a little bit of stress there, because let's face it, we, we have extra stress of the, these days as well. So that adds to anxiety um, and therefore our sleep is more, um, prone to this kind of fragmented sleep or hyper arousal. And again, I talk about that in a minute. But you always have to remember in the background that it may be another sleep disorder. And as I said, there's over 80 sleep disorders. So it's really um, important that if you're having these kind of sleepy episodes during the day, and if you are getting enough sleep, you have to look for another reason. Um, well, is there another sleep disorder going on? And as I said, there, there are so many different ones there. But again, I'll, I'll focus in on the insomnia for this. But I'll briefly, quickly talk about what we call OSA, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Um, and the reason for, for this here, um, and particularly people with lung cancer, there was a study done in 2017 that it showed, um, they did, and it was a small study, it was a study of 140 people, but it showed that almost 26% of those um, actually suffer from this thing called obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And it's basically a respiratory sleep disorder, but it only happens when you actually sleep. Um, so some of the major symptoms that you, you can see, and, and remember sometimes the person themselves actually doesn't know that this is happening. It's usually a bed partner that notices. Um, the patient themselves will know that they're sleepy the next day, um, but they don't know why. Um, so it's basically um, a problem with the structure of the airway. Um, particularly if you lie on your back, your the whole airway kind of changes structure and everything relaxes back and kind of either completely closes in the airway or partially closes in the airway. And um, so there's snoring is, is one of the major symptoms, but not all snorers have obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. The key thing is that in between the snores, there are pauses in the breathing. So everything goes quiet and then it can come back with even a snort or, or a bit of a, a snore. Um, these patients might also have to get up to go to the toilet a lot during the night and they don't have to go excessively to the toilet during the day. Um, probably wake up with a dry mouth or have a, a drink beside the bed at night because they're dropping the, the mouth open to get this extra bit of air in. It could be night sweats, it could be morning headaches because along with this kind of closing in of the airway, there are drops in oxygen levels. And with these drops in oxygen levels, it's that kind of drop in oxygen levels that, that alerts the brain that the person is not breathing properly. So the brain's way of rectifying that is trying to keep you as close to wakefulness as possible. So it's really not allowing you to get into that deep sleep. So again, this is the, 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 the condition that I said where people can get a huge amount of sleep time, um, but they're actually not getting the proper quality of sleep. And that's where this whole sleepiness comes in. Um, and, and they're extremely sleepy throughout the day. Um, I've actually even seen patients fall asleep in front of me. 
Um, but as I said, that, that can be, it's probably the second, it is the second most common sleep disorder that, that there is. Um, insomnia, this is the most common sleep disorder of all. Um, and in the general population, it affects about 15%. Um, I'd say the general population that has hugely increased now, um, again, because of the COVID um, pandemic. But there are different types of insomnia. Um, and the one I suppose that we all recognise is you get into bed and you can't sleep for hours and hours. Um, that is one type, but there's also a more common type as well, where you have absolutely no problem falling asleep, but you can't stay asleep. You also have early morning awakenings and you also have getting on refreshed sleep as well. Um, there's again, there's it's not just the nighttime problem, you know, if you have very short sleep or you're, you know, you've all these symptoms. But if you're getting up and feel, functioning to the best of your ability the next day, you don't have a problem. But there, with insomnia, there are a huge amount of daytime consequences because it's not nighttime and daytime, they're not two separate entities, it's a 24 hour cycle. So you have fatigue, you have concentration, impairment, um, you have poor performances in work, um, you have headaches. And the other thing for, in particular about insomnia is you start to have these concerns or worries about sleep. Um, with cancer and sleep, and I suppose the, the treatment that we use now for insomnia, which is the CBT, um, that was a lot of that research was actually done on cancer patients because we know with the diagnosis of cancer and then subsequent treatment, it plays absolute havoc with our sleep. With cancer, you have the pain, you have the anxiety of the unknown, you, you can have depression. You also have this fatigue as well. And, and I've talked a little bit about fatigue because that can actually really kind of start to make a problem with sleep. You can have tummy GI problems, again, the sweats, the breathlessness, medications. Um, they can play havoc with your, nearly all medications that you take and um, will can have some kind of an impact on, on your sleep quality, but also hospital stays. Um, that causes huge problems with, with, with sleep. The hospital environment is probably one of the worst environments for sleep. Um, it's noisy. It never, it never gets quiet. It never gets completely dark um, and usually can be quite hot as well. Um, so that's, um, and, and you know, th this can all kind of start the problem with, with, with sleep. Um, again, once we have a problem with sleep, the anxiety kicks in. Um, and this, it's like a bi-directional um, bi um, um, thing with anxiety and sleep. The more anxious you are, the less likely you are to sleep. The less you sleep, the more anxious you actually become. Um, we can see that, um, again, with cancer patients, depression can be a factor as well, and that can affect up to 37%, depending on studies you look. I actually was looking at a study last night, and that actually pulled it up to 43%, and that was a study that was done in 2019. Um, and then anxiety, up to 19%. I actually even still think that that anxiety is a little bit underestimated. But when you compare that to the general population of 5% and 7%, um, that, that's a huge difference. So there is all the kind of the anxiety of the, the, the sleep problem, but you also then have the next layer of the anxiety that's going, that goes along with, with the whole cancer diagnosis. Um, anxiety has two kind of effects. It has physiological effects, but it also has the psychological effects, okay? So um, the psychological, physiological effects, if these are physiological changes that happen. Um, so your heart rate increases, you know, you, you get into bed and, you're, and, and you can also be really conscious of your heart rate going. Um, respiration, um, respiration changes, increased blood pressure, you know, the tremors, the sweatings, the muscle tension. And muscle tension, I'm going to give you a technique on what you can do for muscle tension, because that's a huge issue with insomnia. This restlessness that goes along with insomnia as well, and this hyper arousal, um, and that's a real kind of um, consequence of anxiety with, with before sleep. Then, as I said, you have the psychological apprehension. And when, particularly when we talk about, about sleep, you're getting into bed. Will I sleep tonight? Won't I sleep tonight? So there's always that, that apprehension. Um, you feel you've no control over your problem with sleep. 
you're trying all these things and nothing is working. You feel absolutely, it's completely out of your control. And of course, the worry, how is this going to affect my long-term um, outcome? You know, is it particularly with cancer? I'm after reading an article saying that, you know, it's going to stop my, it's going to affect my immune system. I need a really good immune system. Um, and it makes you nervous. And then the fear comes along with that. And when you think of all of that stuff, what happens is that's what your bed actually starts to, to represent for you. Um, and as I said, it becomes a vicious cycle. It's got this bi-directional um, relationship. Um, so when we understand insomnia, we have to think of three things of how the problem actually starts. Because understanding how it starts actually helps to make you feel a little bit more in control of it and make you realize that, you know what? Okay, I do have this problem with sleep, but I can't fix it. Um, we have these, what we call predisposing factors. Um, for example, women are twice as likely to suffer from insomnia. Um, if you are a warrior or an overthinker, that's the most common trait um, of, of the insomniac. And we have social factors. Um, if you're unemployed, um, if you are recently retired, if you're not working, you don't have that normal nine to five, particularly now, we have all lost all sense of time. And that's what happens with insomnia. Your body doesn't know whether it's day or night. But just because you have those factors doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go on to get insomnia because the next part is what we call these precipitating factors. There is a stressor or a trigger that starts a bout of sleepless nights. It could be, as I said, the, the diagnosis of cancer. You know, the, the cancer itself has a huge, all so many factors that's going to, to, to affect your sleep. Um, stressful life events. Um, and now the whole COVID-19, so many people are now, this is stressful, we have financial worries. Um, you know, we have worries about, you know, the children, how, how are you going to homeschool them? There's all these extra worries that we've never had before, never had to deal with before. And it's changing so quickly. Um, and again, we're feeling out of control. But what happens then? So that's, you can imagine how that's actually going to have a, a knock-on effect on our sleep. So just take and say the COVID-19. That's the problem. That's the start of my sleep. A sleep problem. We're going to get out of this and we have to realize that there is going to be light at the tunnel. But so say maybe a year down the line, um, two years down the line, maybe COVID, kind of a distant memory. What can happen for some of us, that sleep, our sleep never goes back to a normal pattern. Okay. Because what happens is over that time, while we're having the problem with sleep, we start to develop bad habits to do with sleep. Um, and this is what we call these perpetuating factors. And particularly with cancer, the fatigue that goes along with that can lead to excessive amounts of time in bed awake. Um, and what happens then, the whole connection between bed and sleep actually starts to get broken down. Um, there can be naps during the day and your body is basically just trying to pick up this bit of sleep wherever it can and what happens is these bad habits now that we have they basically start to kind of add into what we call this psychophysiological insomnia basically the poor sleeping actually becomes the normal pattern because if you do it and you repeat this poor sleep over and over again it basically becomes a learned behavior. Um, and that's where this whole cognitive behavior therapy can, can, um, can come into effect to, to rectify the problem. That it basically unlearns all these bad behaviors and introduces new ones. Cortisol is hugely important when we talk about problem sleeping. And cortisol is the stress hormone. Um, our cortisol levels are higher at the morning time and they start to decrease during the day. Um, and basically before sleep, they should be really, really low. If it's a thing you're worried before sleep or there's a bit of stress there, um, I would certainly say don't look at any kind of news headlines with COVID-19 around from before you sleep because it's going to get you stressed. I also advise people to usually probably not look at politics before sleep either and um, because that can get you stressed. Um, it's complete relaxation before bed because if you have higher levels of cortisol, it leads to this what we call hyper arousal in sleep and your sleep becomes very, very fragmented. It's like your body's falling asleep but it's actually just waiting to be brought back awake and um, because of this, this high levels of cortisol. 
um, as I said, it's, it's this hyper arousal or you feel hyper vigilant while you're asleep. So it's really, really important to, 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 for this relaxation. Um, okay, treatment was it sleep and medication. Um, again, this is really not the way to go long term now. Um, the medical council has really started to cut down on sleep and medication. Um, it doesn't work. Um, you basically um, have to keep up on the dose to have the same effect. And particularly um, with cancer patients, if you're on a lot of medication, you can be on heavy duty medication, and now you're introducing another heavy duty medication, that can interact with each other. So a lot of the GPs can be quite, um, they'll hold back a good bit on, on, on prescribing this heavy duty medication, which doesn't work long term. Short term, absolutely fine. Long term, not the way to go. This cognitive behavioural therapy is now the gold standard. Um, and it's all about changing our misperceptions about sleep, getting rid of those bad habits and introducing new good habits. And it does have a success rate of over 80%. It's giving you the tools to deal with your sleep and getting your sleep back into a normal pattern. So things that don't work before I go into a couple of things, the tips to give you. Things that don't work. There is so much stuff out there. If you look here, it says the sleep aid industry is estimated $76 billion. That was last year. Let me tell you, that has gone shot up with everybody having problems with sleep. Um, just down there at the bottom, um, they did um, a study in the UK, um, a chemist, um, chemist for you. They showed that over-the-counter medications and the, all the pillow sprays and all of that to help sleep shot up by 708%. So that is an absolute huge increase. Even higher than that, a request to, to, for, um, for sleep aids, uh, and this is from UK Meds, increased by 1,978 um, since basically since February, March. Um, all these other things that I've shown you here, these sprays, lotions, no, they don't. There's no. There's no scientific evidence to show that they'll work. Also, they say in eating cherries. There's melatonin in cherries, but you'd need buckets of cherries to be eaten, and you'd probably stay awake the whole night because you'll have a pain in your belly. Um, so to be avoided. Um, there's no kind of superfoods. Um, what I would say is avoid anything too sugary and nothing with chocolate. Um, but also inaccurate information is out there that that's actually making the problem worse. Um, I heard one so-called expert talk this week um, and it said the more you sleep the longer you will live. Absolute rubbish. Do not believe that. Um, again it's all about the quality of sleep. You must go to bed at the same time every night. No you don't. You're going to go when you're feeling sleepy. Okay. Sleep hygiene, again, that doesn't work. I'll quickly go through that. Um, but sleep hygiene is the stuff we should all be doing. If you've chronic insomnia, sleep hygiene is not going to work. It's not going to fix the problem, okay? So what does work? Sleep hygiene, as I said, that really doesn't work. It's important, um, but things like diet, um, have regular meal times. It's all about putting a sense of time back into your day over that 24 hours, seven days a week. So have strict diet or have your breakfast at the same time, have your lunch at the same time, have your main meal at the same time and no later than probably seven o'clock. Particularly now, um, if you are confined or cocooning in your house, you lose all sense of time. You know, you don't even know what day of the week it is. So you have to put these things in place to give the body a sense of time more so now more so now than ever exercise extremely important always best to get exercise earlier on in the day um, and try to definitely not exercise in close to bedtime again the bedroom environment is hugely important noise make sure you always close the window at night because even if you've double glazed windows, you open that window, you're letting noise in. So any kind of neighbor's dog barking, a car, any of that is actually unexpected noise can actually wake you up. Temperature, cooler is always better than temperature. Um, I would probably suggest that you actually, but even if you wanted to have a shower around eight o'clock at night, to purposely bring up your whole body temperature. Because again, you're trying to recreate that natural process or that natural physiological occurrence where your core body temperature dips from, from is at its highest at 8 p.m. and then it starts to decrease rapidly. 
ensure that again light um, is hugely important it's the biggest determinant when we sleep and when we wake i would start to maybe start to dim the lights maybe around 10 o'clock at this time of year that means keeping the lights as bright as possible and then say come time 10 o'clock or half nine ten o'clock you put on a dim light and um, you bring down the level of light you are sending a signal to your body that there is a physiological change occurring um, and you're trying to boost that product, get that melatonin start to be to be produced. Um, ensure your bedroom is completely pitch black dark. If you need to get a blackout blind, get a blackout blind. It's bright at about it's bright at five o'clock in the mornings now, even before that. And if you are allowing that light to come into your bedroom, your melatonin levels now are going to drop, and that's the biggest signal to your body to actually wake you up. So it's light is so so important. Um, again, I said blackout blinds are also um, an eye mask, a good quality eye mask and one that's comfortable as well. Smart devices, again, I think we all know this by now anyway, that the, the blue light from the smart devices really does hamper the production of melatonin. So all smart devices shut down two hours before bed. Um, but as I said, I think most people kind of know that by, by now anyway. Um, I'll skip on. Stimulus control therapy. This is a huge thing that, that we, 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 um, we advise in the clinic. When you start to have a problem with sleep, and also, as I said, the fatigue that tends to go along with can that can be as a symptom of the cancer, you will tend to have huge long periods of time in bed. You know, you might be going for a rest, but you're now spending a really long time in bed but a very small portion of that is actually asleep. So now the whole connection between bed and sleep gets broken down. You might be resting in bed, you might want to watch a bit of TV, you might want to read a book, but we have to get back to the basics. Bed has to be for sleep because what happens is your mind actually gets confused. It's getting into bed, but saying, okay, I'm in bed, but what am I actually here to do? Because sometimes I sleep, sometimes I rest, sometimes I read a book, sometimes I watch TV. It's all about getting back, bed and sleep. Um, recognize and feeling sleepy. That's always your cue for going to bed after a certain time. And it's what we call a threshold time. So if you find that you're going to bed, you think of, I should be in bed by 11 o'clock. Um, because again, that's a misperception. But if you're now constantly saying, right, I have to get into bed 11 o'clock because that's the best time, you know, that hour before midnight, I've read somewhere that's the best quality sleep. No, it's not. You get to your 11 o'clock. But if you say to yourself, do you know what? I'm actually not sleepy enough. Well, then don't go to bed. You cannot make yourself get to sleep and stay asleep if that need for sleep is not there. And particularly if you've had naps or anything during the day, all of those naps are eaten into that need for sleep. So the need for sleep certainly won't be there at 11 o'clock. If you have a big long lie-in until 12 midday because you've had a bad night's sleep the night before, you have very little time. You're only kind of um, having a sleep debt from 12 midday till 11 o'clock that night. The need for sleep won't be there. The other thing to watch out for is if you're sitting in front of the TV before bed and you're having a little nap, and literally even a little micro sleep, again, that's eating into your need for sleep. And what can be confusing is you're absolutely, can't keep your eyes open in watching the telly before bed. Then you get up into bed and then you're wide awake. It's because you've eaten into that sleep debt and, and that therefore the need for sleep is, is not there anymore. So again, no naps during the day. If it's a thing you're really struggling and you find you can't get through the day without a nap, have a scheduled 20 minute nap um, and always have it earlier on in the day. Get set your alarm, get up after 20 minutes. That's the most refreshing nap you can have. And at then, as I said, even if you have it before lunch, at least then you have more time to build up that sleep debt. 15 minute rule, um, I'd like to call it more 20 minute rule. That basically means that you really should only be in bed awake for roughly 20 minutes. Um, and that's the, the normal amount of time it takes for someone to fall asleep. If you find you're lying there for an hour, two hours, the chances are you're not going to get back to sleep because that busy mind really kicks in. Um, another really important thing is you set your alarm 
every morning and you get up at that time seven days a week because it's actually the get up time that's far far more important than our going to bed time it stabilizes the whole body clock relaxation is so so important it's all about bringing down those cortisol levels and um, two hours before bed you shut off all work activity um, and you sit and you chill and it's whatever relax whatever you do to relax whether it be watching a bit of tv and whether it be reading a book whatever you want to do to keep you relaxed as i said to keep down those stress levels um what can happen is you can be nice and relaxed and then suddenly you get into bed and again the stress just increases because you're oh will i sleep tonight or what's tonight going to be like if you pick some kind of a nice relaxation technique, thing like what well, historically they used to go with this is a thing called progressive muscle relaxation technique. Um, and that's where you're tensing your muscles and you're relaxing your muscles. Um, or you can do a mindfulness technique or whatever little technique that you want to do. Um, there, what I would suggest is that whatever technique you do, and you can do this in bed, do this in bed, lights off. Do your relaxation technique um, i'd always listen to something and you can use your phone to listen to it but make sure that whatever technique you listen to it's only about 20 minutes long i've seen people where they're doing meditation or what mindfulness but they can do it for an hour two hours and that's far too long to keep your it's all about keeping your mind as focused and as relaxed as possible and keeping those cortisol levels down so whatever there's good apps as well like headspace you can do body scans because i said this progressive muscle relaxation doesn't not it's not one size fits all so it's whatever you find that just keeps you nice and relaxed it might be some kind of a visualization story that you use but if you know that that's roughly about 20 minutes long and you come to the end of that technique and you are still wide awake and your mind is really alert i'd be saying get up and leave the bedroom because you're obviously not sleepy enough and the need for sleep is not there and it's this busy mind if you do all your sleep hygiene and you do all the right things and you know you you have that sleep death there the one thing that will keep you awake is that busy mind you're absolutely exhausted but you just can't switch off that busy mind so again it's really important to have that that period before bed to be as relaxed as possible but also a technique for when you get into bed to kind of keep your mind distracted from all the, the, the panic that goes along with that. Um, there are different types of thoughts that we have within this busy mind or when we're lying in bed and we can't sleep. We can have planning or rehearsing thoughts. You can be thinking about your health, thinking about sleeping or the fact that you're not sleeping. If you live alone or you hear a, bump, a, a noise, the wind or something outside, that can get the mind racing. Or and if you do have something or worry that's there, you know, or things to be sorted out, there's a bit of structure to it. But, you know, you might be kind of, things might be okay for you and you're kind of settled and relaxed enough. But because you're in the habit of using bed at that time to think, you now just replace these other kind of planning thoughts with this just random nothing thoughts. Um, and that they're the really kind of busy stuff that goes around in the mind. Um, and again, it's like if you're in the if you're doing a bit of exercise. If you're sleepy, but you start exercising, you're not going to be sleepy during that exercise because your body is busy. You have to think of your mind in exactly the same way. If your mind is busy, you're not going to feel sleepy. As I said, it's just like if you're kind of there on a treadmill running away. Um, you're not going to be sleepy. Likewise, if your mind is busy, you're not going to be sleepy. The other thing as well is when it comes to sleep, particularly insomnia, we have what we call these um, dysfunctional beliefs and attitudes about sleep. Um, we start to um, have all these kind of worries about what will happen if I don't sleep tonight. This is really going to be very bad for my health. And in fact, there's a, a scale that we actually use in, in CBTI and they're actually talking about do, they're in the process of developing one, particularly for cancer patients. Um, because you put this extra pressure on yourself to sleep um, and, and the more pressure you put on yourself, the less likely it's going to happen. So they're, they're, they're talking about adding in two um, extra questions um, on the, the sleep scale. Um, and it's about... Um, I won't sleep. I, I'll actually move on to the next one. I'll show you. It, it'll, it'll make it a little bit more clearer. 
So every thought that you have, there's going to be an emotion attached to it. So for just the, the, a person that has insomnia, I never sleep tonight. And we've probably all said that at some stage. You then think about, okay, what's the emotion that's attached with that? You're going to be worried. You're going to be anxious. You're going to be frustrated. But in actual fact, a lot of the time, these thoughts we have are completely inaccurate. The fact that you said, I'll never sleep tonight, chances are you're always going to get some sleep, okay? So if you just change the way you think and instead say, I'll get some sleep. Do you know what? I don't care if I sleep or not tonight. The emotion attached to that now is going to be much more reassuring. But when you look at these emotions with these dysfunctional thoughts or with cancer patients, if I don't sleep, it's going to affect my immune system. So you can imagine the, the emotion that goes with that. All these negative emotions are really going to impact your ability to sleep. But actually the more accurate version is, most people with insomnia, as I've just said, if you're sleep deprived or you've had a couple of bad nights sleep, the body's way of rectifying that is actually overcompensating on the good quality sleep that really actually helps your immune system. So again, by the more accurate version, it's going to be much more reassuring. But also when you think of all these kind of these negative emotions, that's what your bed now represents to you. So if you think about every time you're setting foot into bed, that's what you're facing. Um, and I certainly wouldn't look forward to getting into bed when I've all that, that emotion to, to look forward to. Um, but it just shows how the way we can think really has a, a, such a negative impact on our ability to sleep. So there's always going to be things to, to, to plan. There's always things that are going to be rehearsed. I'm not going to say don't be thinking about those things because we do have to plan. But bed is not the place to do it. So we have to find somewhere else to do this planning. So what I always get patients to do is you get a journal or just a notebook for yourself. At some time during the end of your day, but before your two hour of a wind down time, you give yourself 15, 20 minutes and you sit down with your notebook and you basically put the day to rest. How did today go? You write it down. What have I got to plan for tomorrow? And you write that down. So all of the kind of stuff that you are now have been previously thinking about in bed, you now put in your journal. And now you have it in black and white. And what you do then is you close your book. And that is the day over and done with. Another thing, we're, we're nearly coming to the end now. I know I'm probably in conscious of time here. Thing called paradoxical intention. The harder you try to sleep, the less likely it's going to happen. So a little technique that you can actually do in bed is you lie in bed, but you actually keep your eyes open and you look straight ahead and you say to yourself, I'm going to keep my eyes open. I'm going to force myself to stay awake. And what you actually do if the need for sleep is genuinely there, the opposite is going to happen and you're actually going to fall asleep. So that's a nice little tip to, to try to do as well. And the last slide I'm going to go on to is sleep restriction therapy. This goes against everything um, that when people come in to see me, this is what they really think, oh, this is definitely not going to work. But it actually is to restrict your time in bed. What you do, you can keep a sleep diary. And what you do is you look at the, the average amount of time that you actually spend asleep and you restrict your time in bed to that amount. Um, it's really to get you sleeping for 90% of the time in bed. Um, and that's what, what, what this sleep restriction does. Um, but what it also does is when you kind of restrict your sleep, it actually increases the need um, for good quality sleep. And it actually increases that sleep debt. So the more sleepier you are, the more you're going to, likely you are to fall asleep quickly, but also to stay asleep. So we completely restrict time in bed. Um, and that can be a big shock to, to, to people because they kind of like their bed and they like the rest and the, the, they like the watching the TV and the reading the book. So this is the best way to kind of shock the body clock back into a normal pattern because remember, that's what's actually happened. So again, as I said, there, there's lots of kind of free diaries, etc., that, that you can actually use online. But it's all about basically 
set a get up time every single morning, despite how good or how bad you've actually slept. Um, and that it's, it's all about implementing routine, routine, routine. Um, and it's like when it comes to sleep, that's the biggest thing you can actually do to help your sleep. Um, and that's it. I'm going to um, just stop sharing that now. Um, so I'm just going to stop here. Now. Okay, Helen, do you want to come in there now? or? Thank you very much. Thanks, Breach. Um, I'm going to just put my screen back up for a moment. Um, so, yeah. So, Breach, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I know we're going a little bit over time, but we'll probably give another extra five minutes if that's okay with the audience. Um, just for the important part of, of the session, really, to answer some q and I really liked what you said about there about don't believe everything you think. I think that's a really good um, exercise, isn't it, of the mind. Um, and I think, you know, we were talking at the beginning about making action plans. I think a sleep diary would be excellent if, some, if people mm -hmm. wanted to consider doing that. It's all part of a process of looking at how, how your sleep really is, isn't it? Yeah, the sleep diary is great because it's when you look at it in black and white, you know, sometimes if, if you ask me now, how did I sleep last night? I probably wouldn't be able to tell you. So if you get up in the morning and, and you do, you fill out your sleep diary straight away. It's, it's you know, it's, it's there in black and white. And a lot of the times, like, yeah, do you know what? I actually got more sleep than I think I did. And we do all sleep more than we think we, we did. Um, but it's good to see it in black and white. Excellent. So there's, there's a couple of um, websites there, our own, mariekeating.ie and insomniaclinic.ie, which is the clinic you run yourself. Bridge, if anybody wants any specific, um, you know, further help or CBI or um, further information. And also, Bridge, while you were talking, you mentioned um, further resources, which I think would be very useful um, for our audience. So looking at mindfulness and relaxation centers in Beaumont. Headspace, I know, is common or calm, but again, if people are not aware of them, they're really good um, apps to maybe download. Um, the National Sleep Foundation um, and the Sleep Council and the Road Safety Authority. So they're really good resources endorsed by yourself as well, Breach. Yeah. So we'll move on to the Q&A and, um, and we'll, we'll see uh, where, how, we, how we're getting on. Um, where are the Q now? Okay, so let's. Uh, we have uh, some questions here, Breach, that I'll let me move over now. Okay, so the first question is from Bernie Breach. Um, I get anxious when it's time to go to bed. I'm tired because I know it's hit and miss if I will sleep right through. I fall asleep straight away, but can wake as bright as a button one and a half to two hours later. I've tried listening to music, lavender oil, etc., but nothing works. This goes on about four to five times a week. Any suggestions, please? Yeah, this is really, really common. And um, you know, you, the, I suppose the first thing to, to kind of that you have to learn the difference between is there is a difference between feeling tired and feeling sleepy. And I know when we're, we have a problem, if we try to implement, you know, go to bed at the same time every night. So whatever time she's normally going to bed at, I would say instead of looking at the clock and wall, say, this is my bedtime because this is the time I always go to bed at, I would ask the question, am I sleepy enough that I'm going to fall asleep quickly and stay asleep? Um, because I know she is falling asleep at the, the for, you know, for, for like an hour, an hour and a half. So it's like she's having one cycle of sleep and then she wakes up. But then she's had a good chunk of good quality sleep, so the need for sleep is not there anymore. So it can be difficult to get back to sleep. So the first thing is to make sure nice and relaxed, do that relaxation technique in bed for about 20 minutes. But if she's not asleep after those 20 minutes, get up out of bed and go to a living area and just be as relaxed as you can, read a book, listen to a bit of, of, of music, whatever but go back to bed only when feeling sleepy. So that's always the cue is recognizing feeling sleepy. But that can be difficult because a lot of people with, with insomnia, they've nearly lost the ability to feel sleepy or they feel sleepy at the wrong time. So it's really kind of pushing yourself 
until you feel absolutely so sleepy that you really can't hang on anymore. But again, implementing that little bit of sleep restriction. So really strict get up time. Um, and just, as I said, it's, it's all about routine as well. So just recognize and feeling sleepy, but that does take a bit of time. Okay, thanks. So the next question is, I wake up to go to the loo three to five times during the night. Any suggestions? Okay. You have to again figure out, is this a habit? Um, because it's a common habit with insomnia. You wake up and you're thinking, oh, maybe I better go to the toilet now because if I don't go, it'll only wake me up again. Sure, I go anyway. Um, and then it just becomes a habit. If it's a thing that you don't have to go to the toilet a lot during the day and this is only happening at night, again, find out whether it's a habit or not. Try to restrict your fluid intake from about seven o'clock in the evening. But there's a really good tip that you can do to sort out whether it's a habit or not. The second you wake up, instead of thinking, oh, do I have to go to the toilet? What you should do is just start repeating the word the every two seconds. And this is to try to kind of Stop any emotions getting into the head. Stop any thoughts getting into the head and getting you back to sleep really, really quickly. It is a technique that you have to, to practice. But if you kind of perfect that technique and you're falling back to sleep within a couple of minutes, then you don't genuinely have to go to the toilet. Sometimes they're getting up to go to the toilet. If there are other symptoms there, like the snoring, the pauses in the breathing, um, that, that what we call it's nocturia, it's getting up to go to the toilet excessively. It may be that it can be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Um, but I think the first thing to do is limit um, the fluid intake from about seven in the evening. And if you are waking up, do the little technique of the the, 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 um, to just stop you thinking, do I have to go to the toilet? So little things like that might help. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and Liz here is asking, I fall into a deep sleep quickly, but wake often at about 4.30 and then can't get back to a proper sleep. Mm -hmm. Try mindfulness, but it doesn't always work. Okay. If you're waking up around the half four mark or whatever, remember none of us sleep 100% of the time. We, it's normal to have little brief awakenings, particularly towards the latter end, because the need for sleep is no longer there. What I would suggest is, again, make sure you're really, really sleepy going to bed. Maybe push your, your, your bed going to bed time a little bit forward. Um, but if you do wake up, make sure the room, that blackout blind or an eye mask, because it's kind of normal now these mornings because the lights are so bright. So if there is light coming into the room, it's a normal physiological occurrence to happen because of that light. Um, melatonin levels are no longer there. Um, <clears throat> Again, it can become more of a habit as well. So again, if you wake up at that half four mark, again, give yourself about 20 minutes. Do a little bit of mindfulness that lasts about 20 minutes. But if it's a thing that then after you don't fall back asleep, I would get up, go to a living area. Nice, make sure that it's nice and dark in that living area. Do a little bit of, of reading, dim light. Don't look at the clock. That's another thing as well. Clock watching is a really bad habit because you, you, you start to panic then when you see the time. But sit there, read your book, listen to music. And if you feel sleepy, go back to bed. If you don't feel sleepy, you sit there basically until your alarm clock goes off. And that, it's, so it's all about, again, getting this whole rhythm back in. But the waking up can be a habit, um, but it might also be to do with the light levels at this time of year. Okay, thanks, Bridge. We'll probably take two more questions and then we'll close. But um, for those of you who've asked questions and we haven't answered them here today, Bridge is happy to answer them and we put them up on our website under Frequently Asked Questions um, in, in probably hopefully over the next couple of days anyway. So the next question is, hi, Bridge, would you recommend a particular type of pillow that can aid sleep? Example, for example, is a firm pillow better? Is natural down pillow better than foam? To be honest, it's whatever is comfortable. Um, there's so many, as I said, the whole sleep aid, it, you can pay, I've seen for pillows, you can pay over a hundred euros. I've seen one for even nearly going on 200 euros, promising you're going to have the best possible night's sleep. But you know what? I kind of, it was at a, a, a kind of a conference I saw it 
And I put my head on it and I probably wouldn't sleep a wink because it just didn't suit me. It was far too hard. It's more of a comfort issue. Um, sometimes if you're feeling that your, your breathing is not great, maybe just have yourself a little bit elevated. But again, if you're not comfortable, you're not going to sleep. It's like having these mattresses as well. They say, oh, talk to our sleep expert. We'll tell you the best mattress. Well, guess what? What might be the nice best mattress for me is not going to be the best for you. So it's purely a comfort comfort issue you know um you know if someone has the duck feathers and they're allergic to to, to feathers or if they have allergies that's not going to work for them might be loving and comfortable but it's not going to work for them so it's really an individual thing okay thanks breach and our final question is anonymous as well um hi after getting my chemotherapy treatment the following two nights i cannot sleep thank you yeah, look, that's a common one as well. Um, you know, it's probably the anxiety that goes along with the, the, the chemo as well, but also the chemo as well can, can alter the, the, the sleep. And that's, that's unfortunately, you know, any kind of medication you take or anything alters this whole sleep pattern. What I would say is just try to be as relaxed. Again, try to keep routine. But if you do have two bad nights of sleep, you know, it can be nausea, all of these things that goes along with the chemo. And the anxiety as well, just be as relaxed as you can. If it's a thing you're not sleeping for those two nights, don't try to make up for those lost, that lost sleep. It might be just something that, that you just have to put up with for those two nights. Um, but then try to avoid napping during the day. If you do have a nap, have a short nap to get you through the day. Um, so little things like that, but just trying to keep that structure. And don't panic. Um, two nights lost sleep, okay, it's not ideal the following days, but it's not going to have any lasting effects on you. When you do get to sleep the next night, the need for sleep will certainly be there. But just try not to knock that routine out too much. Short little naps earlier in the day just to kind of get you through that day. Okay, well, I think we'll close off there, Breege, with you. Um, I'd like to say on behalf of the Keating, and I'm sure on behalf of all our audience, thank you so much. You've learned so much today and it's it's a topic we don't talk about enough. I mean, I, talk, I think we talk about it and leave it in small amounts, but certainly learned an awful lot today. And thank you, Breach, for that. Good. So we'll just, um, I'll just finish off um, here with just a note. So, so I suppose our closing remarks remain, stay safe, protect each other, hold firm and take care of yourselves. Um, and for those of you who'd like to um, keep in touch with the Marie Keating, please do keep connected with us for the rest of our series. We have three more, um, three more webinars left in this series. Do sign up for our newspaper as well, our newsletter, I should say, if you want to keep in touch with what we're doing. Um, and there's always an opportunity to maybe have a, a virtual coffee morning um, with your friends, families, or, or even your business. Um, so do keep us in mind. It's a very difficult time for charities um, and we're, we're no different to any other charity. So um, what I'd like to do now is just invite you maybe to attend next week's uh, webinar. So the, next week, it's uh, Dr. Eddie Murphy is coming to speak to us, clinical psychologist. Um, and it's an evening session between 7 and 8 p.m. So it's Tuesday, 26th of May. Thank you very much for coming on board this evening.